Welcome back to Dan Sprague. Well, joining us on set at this time, Martin George, attorney at law. And uh, also we have uh, a former, well, I have to say, a former worker of Asmatal on the telephone. Uh, he has had uh, issues. He was injured on the job. And we're going to find out how all of this impacts his future. Mr. George, maybe you can bring uh, this part of the discussion into context. You have a client who was injured. Yes, he was, he was, um, actually he suffered two work-related injuries at ArcelorMittal. And the interesting thing, Hema, is as we got into the matter in terms of the legal battle, we then discovered through the union that apparently the company has of late had a very bad record in terms of worker injuries and poor health and safety practices because we recognized that there were several other workers who had similar situations but who didn't yet take their matters to court. So our client was, in a sense, a standard bearer, you know, in terms of actually going towards litigation in his matter. And the point is, it is still pending before the court, so there's a serious question as to how this announcement on Friday is going to impact on his matter. Can your client work at all? Well, the thing is, based on the medical reports, in terms of the job he was doing, at ArcelorMittal, he was not able to. The doctors had recommended lighter duties, and then, of course, then he suffered a second injury, which then made his situation worse. So it's really something that has to be resolved. There needs to be some finality to it. We made contact with the attorneys for ArcelorMittal on Friday. They expressed surprise at the whole scenario, indicating that you know they had um, certain outstanding obligations, which they would now quickly look to try to get settled. But I mean, the point is that's irrelevant to our issue because at the end of the day you have a legal matter in court and we need to have some determination of the matter and some kind of judgment or liability and then you look to see um, in terms of collecting thereafter. Now the employee that we're speaking about is actually on the line. Roger, good morning. How are you? Hi. Can you give us an idea? Now we, we are speaking to your attorney on set. You were injured on the job. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, I was a chair on a job how long since 2010. You, since 2010. How long have you been uh, suffering and how long, uh, in, ter in terms of how has this impacted your everyday life? Okay, Rod, you have to listen on your telephone and not on your television because you're going to get a feedback. Okay, Martin, well, why are we trying right, to resolve okay. that? But ju just let me clear up a couple things sure. that um, I, I want the public to understand. I've heard it said repeatedly that ArcelorMittal is a privately owned company. That's not true. ArcelorMittal is a publicly listed company. It's listed on several stock exchanges, the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So the point is this is a massive behemoth of a global entity that is publicly traded. Now, there are certain rules and guidelines which must obtain when you are dealing with a publicly traded entity. Remember, it's a company that's headquartered in Luxembourg. Right. All right? And it was originally from the Arcelor side, which is a Belgium entity, and then the Metal side, which is um, from the Lachmi Metal um, entity. Now, the hostile takeover that occurred Arcelor tried to resist it at first, and then eventually uh, Metal upped his offer and they were able to do the merger. Now, two interesting things that we must re recognize, Hema. On March 10th, which I think is the actual day that the judgment in the industrial court was delivered, and it's, I am sure, purely coincidental, there was an extraordinary general meeting in Luxembourg of the directors and shareholders of ArcelorMittal whereby they made certain votes in terms of the rights issues, in terms of the shareholdings. Just for the uh, viewers, the rights issues concern the majority and minority shareholders. That's right. Okay. Thank you. We have our <laughs> junior attorney on set. Not really. Right? So the thing is, and then now, what we have today, 14th March, there is going to be on the New York Stock Exchange, the allocation of the rights as per that vote that took place. And as a result of that, there's now a $3 billion 
offering that is going to be placed on the New York, New York Stock Exchange starting today at 5 p.m. So the thing is, you have to understand, in the global scheme of things, they would have seen the Trinidad operations as disposable, particularly if it is that they can leverage off the debt and get rid of that entity, so therefore they move ahead with their dealings internationally. So we must understand that. So therefore, this is not something that the union on its own can fight. This has to be at a government level that the government of Trinidad and Tobago must get involved. You must go back to your agreement, look and see, well, in the initial agreement, did you do what you were supposed to do? When you said you were going to offer shares in the company to local purchasers or local investors or to the employees, did you honor that? Because saying that the shares are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, that's no um, bar to you doing so. We have so many locals who own companies on the New York Stock Exchange. We have to go straight to the seven o'clock newscast. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about this now convoluted affair, a web of lies or a web of deception, international conglomerates. They know really how to maneuver the markets. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Trinidad and Tobago. We're continuing our conversation with Martin George, who's revealing some interesting facts. Nothing is really coincidental in this world anymore. <laughs> the fact that Arsenal Metal, the, uh, at Luxembourg, they held a number of high-powered meetings looking at the issues of rights. And also there's a $3 billion float now available uh, for purchase on the International Stock Exchange, and that's listed in the major stock exchange across the globe. All of this, when you have a conglomerate, they normally look at all of their subsidiaries, they look at their cost centers, and they look at where not only transfer price pricing comes into, into play, but they also look at the leveraging of their assets, and they look at where the losses and the profits come in. Now, you're calling for the government to intervene. What I don't understand is if it's a locally incorporated company, then why was it not listed in the local stock exchange? What is the, uh, what is it? Well, I, I don't know in terms of how they would have structured it locally, but hey, man, just remember, it's possible that you can incorporate locally and not transfer your assets to the local company. Okay, so right, in other yes. words, the foreign headquarters would still own the well, assets, yeah. but you simply have a corporate structure incorporated locally just for the record to say, well, yes, we are operating, operating in okay. Trinidad and Tobago. But the point is you have no assets there. It's a similar scenario. Take, for instance, if you look at the structure, and I mean, the point is it's something that's used all the time. Eh? You know, um, you, you look at something like Caribbean Airlines, I mean, to use our local example. While we have several, you know, um, entities and branches all over, the point is your headquarters remain in Trinidad and everything in terms of your asset ownership remains here. So similarly, it may be that ArcelorMittal decided to keep the asset side of things international and you simply incorporate locally you operate locally but then the point is you are funneling everything back out to your headquarters what are the options available to the government at this time also Matal has decided their international shareholders and stakeholders have decided to close shop liquidation is on the table at this time yes well the thing is Hema unfortunately we are really in a scenario where we were looking at the horse having bolted mm -hmm. You know, so you, you're seeking to close the stable door, but the horse has already bolted. And the difficulty we have is that unless there are elements in the original agreement, which we can go back to and hold them accountable legally, if you do not have that, then the government really has little to say in the matter. We must be able to separate, unfortunately, the difficulties that the workers themselves face from the legally binding requirements of the governing agreement in terms of the original purchase. Now, while, of course, we must try to find a solution for the workers, the government may not necessarily have a legal basis for intervening on behalf of the workers. So they're simply selling promises in the wind with the talks that they're going to talk to Mittal this morning? Well, the point is, you see, the, the, they need to go back and look at how was this structured in the first place? What are your legal obligations? Is it that you are allowed to simply pack up shop and leave? Or are there consequences? Were there clauses built into the contract which would give you um, the option of penalties or anything of the sort? That's what the government has to do at that level. But as I say, this is separate and apart from the industrial relations side of things, which is where you are having the workers on the breadline and out of a job and with no um, you know, proper compensation. Uh, Roger's on the line. Roger, good morning. Sorry about that. Um, 
I was asking you about how has your life changed since the injury and how has the company treated with you? I know that Martin is representing you. Now the possibility of liquidation, Arsene Metal is closing shop. Uh, what does this mean for you? How has your life changed and what are you hoping to see come out of this? Well, good morning. Good morning. What I would like to come out of this is justice in terms of respect because the 6th of July this year would make it Six years I injured, and um, I actually did three surgeries. But during the space at that time, it wasn't easy because having to do three surgeries after one, Arsenal Metal Management actually tried to rush you to therapy to get ready to come back out of work. They actually treated your injury like an in-house injury. They didn't actually want OSHA to know about it, you know, all this sort of thing. So it was really, really frustrating during that long space of time, you understand? And then up to 2012, after my last surgery, right, they actually decided to not pay me at all. No money, no finances. I have a big family, and that was taking a real, real serious toll on my life, you understand? I actually still in pain because there's no therapy or anything like that, right? Then I injured my back back in 2013 when I went back out trying to see if I could make it, which I told them my hand was still in a lot of pain. And on top of that, it got worse. You understand? They not even have phone call or anything like that. How are you going and so forth? Roger, if it is you don't receive any money from the company, the fact that liquidation has begun or the possibility of liquidation has uh, started, it means that the creditors will be paid off first from whatever remains in the company. If you don't get anything at all from Asmetal, what would that mean for you? To be honest, the answer to that this morning is God. <laughs> because the union has tried, I myself has tried, everybody's trying, and my lawyer right now is doing the same. And if the government step in, that will be good. But at the end of the day, it still come back to God because these people really look like they just don't care. You understand? So that's all I could say about that. But I would like everybody, including myself, to get the just payment from Arcelometer because when you're inside at that place, it's not no play. It's hard work. And everybody does perform once they're inside that day. A Have you been... Have you been able to secure any other sort of employment, or can you secure any other employment, uh, considering your medical uh, situation? No, actually, you see, uh, you see, to be honest, three surgeries, no bella roses on your right shoulder, because I'm a right hander. That has already restricted me from any sort of activity, even playing with my kids, and it's hard to sleep, because when this hand falls asleep before me, I have to wake it up. And if I sleep in any night and I move this hand, this hand does wake me up. That is the kind of pain that is in the shoulder, much less my back in trying to sit down low, getting up fast or anything like that. So is this a wrong painful situation with me? So it's not easy to come back no point in time. So and employment, that would be really hard because I would be lacking performance on anybody's job. And it better make sense. I would be a hazard. Roger, thanks, yes, so, thanks so much for taking our call this morning to share your side of the story. We hear 600 plus workers, but we really don't know the details of the lives affected uh, by the closure. And as we heard this morning, it's 2,500 in all, because you look at the auxiliary services and the multiply effect. Yeah, Hema, let, let's just touch briefly on a couple things. We heard the company indicate locally that they were in debt, and yeah. you know this is the reason why they were closing. But when one looks at the global picture, and you see the thing is, we have to recognize that we are a subset of a global entity. ArcelorMittal in 2015 declared 63.6 billion US dollars in revenue for that year alone. 2015, all right? And they had crude steel production of 92.5 million tons, and own iron ore production was 62.8 million tons. So in other words, you cannot tell me that